Welcome to the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. My name is Paul Valenish Scott, and I'm going to give you a behind the scenes tour in the Invertebrate Zoology Department. We focus primarily here on marine invertebrate animals, animals without backbones. And some of the things you might recognize, like little spiky urchins, or perhaps lobsters. But then there's other things that maybe you've never seen before and wonder what those are, like a piece of a tentacle from a giant squid that came right off the coast of our islands. This is a piece of whale skin, a, a whale that died and was up on the beach, but it has invertebrates attached to it. So a gray whale is gray because these barnacles give it that grayish color on its skin. But here's another one that we probably haven't seen. It lives a little further offshore, but very common inhabitant in Santa Barbara Channel is the basket star. Very, very cool animal, uh, delicate tentacles, which with it uh, just grabs plankton out of the water. We have literally hundreds of thousands of small jars and organisms that document the biodiversity of invertebrate animals in the Santa Barbara region. These animals have all been uh, examined by scientists, by myself and other scientists here at the museum. We've cataloged them and they're available on our database. And the database is actually available to the world, so scientists around the world know what we have in here. Some organisms don't fit in, in classic jars, gallon jars, so we actually had these custom made to hold some of the largest organisms. So what we have in here is a giant squid, which are fairly common locally. Voracious predators, they have very long tentacles, uh, lots of suckers and uh, interesting parts to their body. And scientists look at these to understand how they live, how they reproduce, but also to learn how many different species there are. And as one of a scientist from Japan who specializes in this type of giant squid found out recently, this is actually a new species right here in this tank that we had no idea that we had. The specimens that we have here are absolutely dazzling. The Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History Shell Collection is one of the largest in the United States, and in fact one of the largest in the world. We have scientists and students come from all over the world to examine specimens in this collection. And even artists uh, love to come enjoy this place just because of the absolute beauty of what we have in these drawers. And our collection is probably the best in the country when it comes to bivalve mollusks. We also have very unusual animals. People tend to really gravitate towards this really bright green animal and say, well, where could this possibly live? Well, this is a rare and actually endangered species of land snail from Papua New Guinea. It lives, uh, it's a tree snail, so it lives up in the trees. It's gonna blend right in. This animal became endangered because, number one, it's a gorgeous animal, and then the habitat was being uh, destroyed, but now it's under protection. Animals devote actually a lot of energy into making a skeleton like this. This is quite heavy and thick and very ornate. Well, one particular animal has actually come up with a real different plan. She kind of said, I don't want to spend that much energy building a house. So I have a really thin shell, such a thin shell that you can see right through it. So what I'm going to do is just pick up other shells on the ocean floor and attach them to my shell. So it looks like shell art, but this was actually done by a snail in the deep sea. Every shell in this drawer and in this cabinet tells a different story, amazing story of, of life histories, of life on our planet. 
We uh, literally have over 2 million specimens of shells in this room. So I hope you've enjoyed your trip behind the scenes in the Invertebrate Zoology Department at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and look forward to seeing you here. Hi, my name is Paul Collins. I'm the Curator of Vertebrate Zoology here in the Department of Vertebrate Zoology at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. How do you come up with minimum number of individuals of that species represented in your sample? We have how many? 45. 45. Quasar's uh, program is run through the education department here and it's a program that allows high school students to become involved with the museum uh, during their high school career. And so I got Daniel, one of our Quasar students, involved in a senior project uh, on one of the levels. He's taken two of the bags of sediment. I've let him go through the process of sorting out all of the faunal material and then worked with him on identifying uh, what species are represented um, and then quantifying the bones of each of those species so that we know how many individual bones and how many individuals of each species are represented in those two bags. What I'm doing here is just beginning to get this bone sorted out by the individual bone type. Because to identify it, I've got to lay all of this, uh, all the humeri out together, get them sorted left to right, and then match up the ones that are similar. Sometimes it's pretty good size like this one, and there's enough of the element. Um, and bring it back into the collection and compare it to known uh, skeletons of known identified species. So in this case, uh, the first one we'll pull out is going to be um, an ulna from uh, a pelagic cormorant. And so this is the distal end of the ulna of a pelagic cormorant. And you look at it and tell me what you think. Is that a good match or not a good match? Not a good match. Not a good match, right. So it doesn't, doesn't fit uh, that ulna. So we know right away the shape of it is different than any of the cormorants. So the next thing I'll, I'll go to is we'll look at grebe and we'll see whether um, the shape on the grebe um, ulna has the same uh, similarity um, in shape at the, at the distal end. And it looks a little bit different. We ultimately were able to compare this bone to, and this is from what's called a pigeon guillemont. Yeah, that's a, good, that looks like that's a pretty good match. match. Yeah. And so when you lay, lay this bone up, you can look at the overall thickness of the shaft. Mm -hmm. It looks good. Uh, the overall shape looks pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the bone itself is worn on the distal end, so the processes aren't as sharp as they are on a, on a fresh specimen. Yeah. But the actual orientation of those processes are correct, and the thickness of the bone is correct. And so that's what we're looking at and hoping, hoping to find, to be able to document some of those uh, species that were there up into the time period when Europeans showed up um, that the ornithologists didn't discover because they were gone by the time the ornithologists started working on the islands. Hi, welcome to the Vertebrate Zoology Department. My name is Krista Fay, and I'd like to give you a peek behind the scenes. Today you're going to experience what we have that's not on view to the public. Let's peek back through both collection rooms. The first collection I'm going to show you is our egg collection. It is the oldest, most historic, and our foundation collection. Store drawer after drawer. Each one of these boxes is one bird's nesting attempt within a season. This is called a clutch.
They're stored individually. They have small holes where the contents of the eggs have been blown out, numbers that say who the collector was, the date, what species it is, and we have specimens that date back to 1868. So this will tell us that American robins in Tennessee were laying four eggs at that time. It will also tell us where they were breeding in, in Tennessee, and if you look at everything we have, where they were breeding in North America. Additionally, we're finding new uses for all of these research collections. Beyond just how many eggs they laid and where they're nesting, we can now do some testing on these eggs. We've realized that you can take a piece of the membrane out from inside the egg and you can actually do a genetic analysis. You can get the DNA from that bird, even though this is almost 100 years old. So you can start looking if there's changes in the genetics of the birds over time. Are they converging with other species? Are they diverging away from other species? We have found that egg collections are very useful in determining the levels of pesticides and other contaminants in the environment. By looking at eggshell thickness, we have found the effects of things like DDT in the environment that was causing thinning. If we didn't have museum egg collections to go back and measure that were in, taken from the environment before DDT was ever introduced, we wouldn't be able to see that thinning over time. So the goal of a curator is to continue to bring in more material to make sure we're keeping that time series viable. A hundred years from now, we're going to want to make sure we had data from 2016, what was going on in the environment. There might be something that happens next month that we're going to track that's very, very significant to the research community. We also have some incredibly rare specimens. This elephant bird was endemic to the island of Madagascar. It stood almost 10 feet tall and weighed 1,000 pounds. A lot of people presume this is probably a dinosaur, that this was tens of thousands of years ago. This is actually a modern bird that was recently driven to extinction in the 1600s, 1700s. For us, it's a true museum treasure, and this is the second elephant bird egg to be received into North America. Museums store all sorts of size specimens, from tiny micro mollusks to blue whale skulls. And here we have an example in the vertebrate department of our large bones. This part of the osteology collection is mostly marine mammal material. You can see we've got the lower mandible from a bowhead whale here. This is a modern piece, it's carved. Walrus, sea turtles, gray whales, blue whale ulna, atlas axis, sperm whale, lower mandible, humpback whales, and even a sperm whale skull. Now I'd like to give you a peek into our bird skin collection. Study skins are used by researchers for a variety of projects. If you have a bird study skin from 1910, that would tell you a lot about what it was feeding on in the ocean, what types of prey were in the ocean at that time. And when we're faced with questions about climate change, that becomes a very powerful analytic tool. And now I'd like to show you inside the vertebrate wet collection area. This room houses all of our specimens that need to be kept in alcohol. These types of specimens are typically things like reptiles, amphibians, and fish that need to be preserved in a wet medium instead of in a box. After 50 years, a frog in a box wouldn't look much like a frog anymore. But well preserved, these animals will stay like they were originally for centuries. Here's a jar of horned lizards. And like most of the other specimens we've seen, each individual animal has a data tag. The genus, the species, the locality from which it was collected, and the date, all of which are critical for any researchers looking at documenting changes in natural history of animals over time. Thank you for joining us today behind the scenes at the vertebrate department of the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. We look forward to hosting you again sometime.